A few years back, I uploaded a review of The Incredibles 2, where I lay out an argument that the sequel to The Incredibles was ruined through rewrites. The sequel was clearly meant to celebrate the first film in its original iteration, but instead through rewrites was twisted into a broken mess that insults the original film. I believe what I described in that review is a clear example of how the film industry has changed in the last decade decade, and how Hollywood has evolved into something much more nefarious. I'm sure you've heard it discussed before that Hollywood is trying to make their films as profitable as possible to foreign markets and attempting to make a billion dollars off of every single blockbuster by appealing to as wide an audience as possible, resulting in nonsensical storylines and bland unrelatable characters and endless meaningless action scenes with no substance. But that's only part of the issue. Money is merely one aspect of Hollywood's motivation to change the conventions of entertainment. I believe that Disney Pixar ruined The Incredibles 2 on purpose, not to capitulate to the demands of foreign markets or appeal to Chinese audiences, and not to make a billion dollars off of a summer blockbuster like we've heard so many times before, but it's my opinion that Disney Pixar rewrote the original script of Incredibles 2 with the intention of destroying everything that we loved about the first Incredibles film. Not only do none of the themes about the importance of family carry over from the first film to the second, but the sequel is structured to actively contradict the lessons that we learned from the original Incredibles movie. I've come to some sobering realizations about the entertainment industry during my career. Things I've wanted to talk about for a very long time, but was too nervous to say because I was worried about sounding like a crazy person. But in the last year, I've managed to gain some reliable contacts on the inside. Creators like actors, musicians, writers, people who were used by the entertainment industry to push propaganda. The same way that I've been used to push propaganda in my past. And they've helped me to understand that not only was I right the whole time about the evil that I've seen, but the entertainment industry is much worse worse than I realized. I used to love film. I mean, I do love film. That's why I dedicated an entire channel to movie reviews. But I can't even bring myself to watch new movies anymore because the experience is too frustrating and painful now. There were always things that bothered me about the way entertainers were treated, the way nefarious messages were hidden in movies and TV shows, the way things that we consider sacred were constantly insulted and destroyed and deconstructed. But the entertainment the entertainment industry is totally broken now. Basic storytelling conventions are ignored or even openly disrespected in the name of pushing agendas. There were always aspects that made me uncomfortable about Hollywood, like for example, the way actors are dehumanized and humiliated by their directors and the media, but I used to be able to ignore that somewhat, kind of brush it off as one of those unspoken rules of entertainment, because I did not know for sure that the actors actors weren't in on it. I didn't know for sure that the actors didn't know that that was what was happening to them. It seemed reasonable that they would have had to have known, since it was so obvious to me, and I'm just some idiot watching. But when it was made clear to me that entertainers do not usually have a choice, that they're used by their controllers, used by their agents and directors, my heart broke. And at the end of this video, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of film franchise franchises that I've loved and enjoyed over the decades, films that I myself have praised, that I'm now totally convinced were intentionally destroyed, intentionally ruined by Hollywood or their directors, to push agendas and attack the value systems that we hold sacred. Decisions that were made in an attempt to demoralize the people who love these film franchises, and demoralize the people who love the characters and the actors who 
who play them. Back in 1984, a supposed KGB defector, Yuri Bezmenov, gave interviews and lectures to American audiences describing the USSR's supposed plan to demoralize the United States with the introduction of certain concepts into entertainment. The main emphasis of the KGB is not in the area of its intelligence at all. Only about 15% of time, money and manpower is spent on espionage as such. The other 85% is a slow process which we call either ideological subversion or psychological warfare. Ideological subversion is overt and open. You, you can see it with your own eyes. All American mass media has to do is to unplug their bananas from their ears open up their eyes and they can see it. There is no mystery. To change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interests of defending themselves, their families, their community and their country. It's a great brainwashing process which goes very slow. Demoralization, it takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. This is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students. Overall, he made a pretty compelling case for how America's cultural cohesion and moral compass can be warped and changed to create a weaker nation and stir up civil unrest. And since then, it seems that a lot of what he predicted has actually come true. The problem is this is a lie. It wasn't the Russians that did this to us. It wasn't the KGB or the Chinese that altered the course of entertainment, turning it into a tool to socially engineer us into a broken culture with distorted morality, causing us to adopt destructive mindsets and believing in broken philosophies. No, we did this to ourselves. It was our own entertainment industry that did this to us. It was our own people who changed film, television, and music into a tool of moral destruction. And social movements like social justice warriors, whatever you want to call them, were trained to be useful idiots in this war for our minds, essentially demanding that the entertainment industry implement these changes into art, all in the name of inclusion and social justice. I've been debunking and arguing against this fake version of progressive entertainment my entire YouTube career, trying to make a case that it's actually regressive. In the old days of the internet, the old days of social commentary, the term woke used to mean something a little bit different. A person that was woke was someone who understood that the banks control the world, that America is a nation of slaves and prostitutes being used for the personal gain and wealth of the elite, that the military industrial complex and the CIA control the entertainment industry. I wasn't the first one to say these things. And Please, God, don't let me be the last. Entire libraries of work, entire archives of information about this used to be available on YouTube and multiple image boards, message boards, other websites only a decade ago. But somehow in the last few years, the term woke has morphed into a blanket term insult to describe people who want social equality or someone who's pro-LGBT or someone who adds advocates for inclusion in media. The term woke was taken away from us. It was stolen from us. And all those old conspiracy theory videos, all those woke websites, have now all been wiped from the internet, along with all those communities who used to speak out against all of these issues. Now don't get me wrong, I am pro-LGBT. I am an advocate for inclusion. I agree with the overall concept of the new meaning of the word woke, and by today's standards, you can consider me woke. But woke culture and woke people are not the same thing as the woke agenda. The woke agenda is an overarching attempt by our controllers to actively demoralize us, to destroy our love for each other, destroy our ability to get along and coexist. It's an attempt to separate us, to 
pit us against each other through identity politics, all while pretending to be against hatred, all under the guise of being against segregation. Yet the end result of all of their work is a more disjointed society, a more disjointed culture, and the more they divide us, the easier we are to control. Obviously, there is an active contingent of far-right wingers that are against inclusion, that are against the LGBT and progressive thought, but for the most part, the reason people tend to get frustrated over a piece of media being too woke is not because it's inclusive. I've argued against that idea for a very long time now. The reason wokeness in media is being received as offensive by audiences is because of the obtuse way that those ideas are shooting horned into films and shows. They talk down to us and belittle our cultural conventions. Media uses wokeness as a veneer or as a cover to deflect from the more nefarious messages that they're trying to push. Entertainment is not made for us anymore. Entertainment is made at us. I can't say that I know for sure when I noticed this happening for the first time, but when Disney took over Marvel Studios and the Star Wars franchise, that's when it became too obvious to ignore. For those of us who grew up with the original edits of the original trilogy, Star Wars was about a very specific philosophy using a very specific dark and gritty tone. It was a very real and meaningful story taken seriously. But that has clearly changed. When I reviewed The Force Awakens and Rogue One, originally I praised Disney for displaying that they seemed to understand the franchise and understand what fans were expecting from the Star Wars universe. And I gave those films a positive response, recommending them as great fan service that also properly introduces Star Wars to a new generation of fans. The way that I saw it, those two films were a promise to the fans that Star Wars was in the right hands. That Disney knew what they were doing. But then when The Last Jedi was released a couple of years later, I reacted extremely negatively to that film. Not only did The Last Jedi break the entire Star Wars universe, it also broke all of the trust and goodwill that Disney had built up with the Star Wars fans. Disney clearly promised a faithful representation of Star Wars that would serve the fans and continue the existing themes and story. Then they intentionally broke that promise and produced a deconstructivist take on the franchise. Right in the middle of the trilogy, The Last Jedi divided the Star Wars community because it was used to intentionally attack our love for that movie universe. The entire theme of The Last Jedi was about killing the past, killing everything that we loved about the old Star Wars. Ryan Johnson subverted every expectation that we had for the film and replaced it with a chaotic, vapid experience with no clear direction, hoping to distract us with goofy jokes and meaningless fantasy elements. At the time, I was confused. I wasn't really sure at the time that this was an intentional attack against Star Wars fans, against a franchise that we hold sacred, nor did I realize that it was an attack on our values and principles for which the original Star Wars films stood, the meaningful messages that they conveyed. How could this be possible, I wondered. Kathleen Kennedy was hand-chosen for this intellectual property because of her decades of experience in the film industry. She even received an endorsement by George Lucas himself, saying that he never would have handed the franchise over to Disney without her in charge. The destruction of Star Wars was not the fault of one shitty hipster asshole director who wanted to make a self-serving deconstructivist take on Star Wars. This can't all be blamed on Ryan Johnson. Kathleen Kennedy didn't just haphazardly dump the responsibility of building upon the existing story on Ryan, hoping that he would understand what the fans wanted. The decision to use Ryan Johnson in this capacity 
was made intentionally by Disney. They knew what they were doing the entire time. They gave Ryan Johnson the reins to the franchise knowing that he would deconstruct it, knowing that he would contradict what we love about it. That was the point. Ryan was hand-picked to push the new agenda. He subverted our expectations to such an extreme that it ignored the core themes presented by the original Star Wars trilogy decades ago. There is no way that Kathleen Kennedy did not know that that was going to happen. There is no way that Disney had no control over the direction of the Star Wars sequel trilogy. The media just tells us shit like that to deflect responsibility away from the executives who make these decisions. Do you really think Disney would spend billions of dollars to acquire the franchise and then just let it fumble through their fingers? Blaming it all on Ryan is just Disney's way of evading the wave of frustration and hatred caused by their decisions. They want you to think that it's the director's fault. At best, Ryan was just a useful idiot, a trained Marxist tasked with updating the franchise with a modern propaganda spin. That's their religion. That's their cult. I want you to think of the greater context. Think of how the Disney Corporation postures all of their film franchises. Disney now owns everything. Disney bought up every intellectual property that they could get their hands on. They even own The Simpsons now because they bought Fox. Disney even owns Fox. Yes, the financial implication of owning everything is that Disney now has a monopoly on entertainment today, obviously. But think about the cultural implication of one corporation owning every intellectual property. The power that they have over the way that all media is perceived and the messages that they convey to our children. Disney has a monopoly on morality too. Disney has a monopoly on culture. Now one massive corporation has total autonomy over the way every beloved IP is presented. The messages that they push. Now one company chooses what is moral, what is progressive, what is meaningful, what is a fair and proper representation of humanity itself. One company shapes the way that we perceive ourselves and our history. One company controls the way that artists and their work are presented and represented to the world. One company is using all entertainers and creators to engineer media that fits one specific vision for reality. Disney's version of woke. That's why everyone hates woke culture in film today. Not because we hate inclusion and diversity. We want those things in film. It's because those messages are being used against us. That desire to have those things included in film is being used against us. Mega corporation funded entertainment is not designed to help us navigate our harsh reality or authentically represent us in a faithful way. They have no interest in even acknowledging reality. They're trying to engineer a new reality. Mainstream social movements and artificially generated reactions on social media play a role in this as well. By constantly demanding that new media media be woke? That it be better at representing different diverse groups? Disney can make it look like they're simply trying to make progressive people happy by including those modern philosophies and identities into media. But I argue that it should never be the responsibility of a mega corporation monopoly to teach us morality. It should never be the responsibility of Disney to represent people that way. Another one of the tactics that these mega corporations employ to deflect and distract us from realizing that they're the ones that are doing this to our culture is that they'll place an easy target in a lead role and then tricking us into thinking that these adversarial characters in the forefront, that the actors involved in the productions are the ones making these decisions. Disney will literally make a film terrible intentionally, then tell the lead actor to stand in front of a podium and dictate who is and is not allowed to comment on their film.
film, belittling a percentage of their own audience. But Disney did all of that so that when we complain that we hate the way that the character was portrayed, we hate the way that the character was vapid and had no personality, we hated that they were two-dimensional and boring, Disney can just turn around and accuse us of hating strong women. Maybe the worst example of a corporate film doing this was likely the 2016 Ghostbusters film. That first trailer was absolute garbage and made the film look terrible and unwatchable. And director Paul Feig responded to almost every single complaint that we made about the film by accusing us of misogyny. But another more nefarious tactic that the new media employs is injecting terrible, cheesy, over-the-top humor into every scene, which serves to help hide the fact that they are actively attacking our culture and our values. By making every serious moment in a film silly, it subverts and bypasses our natural mental defenses against their destructive philosophies. If everything's presented as a joke in a goofy reality, then we're less likely to notice that they're presenting a message that goes against our moral compass. I've felt a lot of fear and anxiety about discussing this topic. You're almost certainly going to want to reject all of this. It is wildly uncomfortable to think about, and I'm forcing you to rethink all of the entertainment that you love. I know that you're likely not convinced yet, and I'm not sure that I can prove any of this in one video, but I have a few examples for you that I'm hoping will help you understand that I am on to something here, that this is not just some bullshit that I'm inventing to scare you. This is something that I've been thinking about for a very long time now. I presented Star Wars as something that we hold sacred, but its destruction and its use against us began well before Disney took over. There were a lot of questionable decisions made by George Lucas to the original Star Wars trilogy films over the years, including the edits that he made to the special editions which were released in 1997. The special edition edits of Star Wars didn't just alter the special effects, they also changed the story as well. The meaning of the films. I think the first time that he did it is also the most obvious story change. When George Lucas altered the famous Han Solo shot first scene, Greedo, a bounty hunter, has Han Solo at gunpoint, threatening to take him into Jabba the Hutt as a bounty. Han Solo says, over my dead body, and Greedo replies, that's the idea. By making that statement, that's the idea, Greedo is admitting that he is going to kill Han Solo. That's what the scene is communicating. That statement was all that Han Solo needed to hear to know that he was a dead man if he didn't make a split-second decision. Solo had every right to shoot Greedo right then and there. Any idiot could have seen that. And in the original edit, that's exactly what happens. In fact, in the original edit, Greedo doesn't even get a shot off at all. You just hear one blast, a puff of smoke, and when it clears, Greedo is dead. That's brilliant cinema. That's dark and gritty and real. We were all fine with that. That was awesome. It was one of the most badass moments in Star Wars. However, all of the subsequent edits since then have changed the order of events, so now Greedo takes the first shot, and somehow Han Solo's head tweaks to the side and dodges the blast before Han Solo finally shoots back. That edit was stupid nonsense, and we all hated it. Yes, that's probably probably the most obvious example of a change to the story, but it sure as hell is not the worst example. Return of the Jedi's story may have been altered the most. The original edit of Return of the Jedi was really dark and gritty, with the Jabba's palace scene including slavery, imprisonment, torture, and worse. What happens to Princess Leia is awful. It's an extremely serious subject 
that needs to be handled seriously. In the original edit, I used to feel like Return of the Jedi walked the line really well in a way that Carrie Fisher was in on it, that she understood the seriousness of the subject matter and got to own it like a boss. Like she had some level of control over how her character was portrayed and how she was represented, which is so important, especially considering what she has to wear in that scene and what her character endures in some of the sequences. But then the special edition comes along in 1997 and ruins the seriousness of these subjects on purpose. We know that Princess Leia is in really big trouble because it's set up in a scene where Jabba the Hutt sacrifices his previous slave to a monster beneath the floor. But George Lucas infamously added a stupid, obnoxious, over-the-top song and dance number to the scene where his previous slave dies. In the original edit, it's super dark. In the original edit, this this is a shocking moment that communicates to the audience that Jabba the Hutt is a cold-hearted, psychopathic murderer and a true villainous monster. So when Leia gets captured later, we understand just how grave her situation is and how awful it must be for her. However, the seriousness of that is ruined in the special edition edits because of the inclusion of the stupid song and dance. Now when Princess Leia gets captured and chained up by Jabba, it doesn't feel like she's now the slave to a disgusting monster who could be capable of doing anything to her. Instead, the tone has been ruined so badly by the silly dance scene. When Jabba grabs her and we see the fear in her eyes, now it just feels like Princess Leia is going to be the victim of a goofy dance number. This not only destroys the entire opening of the film, it destroys the tone of Princess Leia's entire character character arc. Now Carrie Fisher is not in on it. Now Carrie Fisher is just some whore being used because she looks good in a gold bikini. Now it's just George Lucas's creepy fantasy. But wait, Return of the Jedi is about Darth Vader. This is the film that Darth Vader is redeemed. That's really important here. Remember Darth Vader gets redeemed? Well, when this film was originally released in the 80s, it was sort of vague exactly for what he was being redeemed. Just for being evil, for doing bad things. We didn't know what those things were. I was 14 when The Phantom Menace was released in theaters, and even back then there was a lot of resistance to the new direction that Lucas was taking the franchise. As each new installment of the prequel trilogy was being released, we became increasingly shocked as it appeared as if George Lucas did not understand his own material. That he didn't understand the fundamentals of Star Wars. We were all shocked that the new Star Wars films were too clean. The action and the drama felt meaningless. None of the characters' decisions made any sense. The most egregious example is Attack of the Clones, which seemed unfocused and out of touch. Especially Especially with the Anakin Padme love story. At first, it felt as if George Lucas was trying to recreate the adversarial love drama in The Empire Strikes Back, using Natalie Portman to mimic the way Princess Leia resisted the advances made by Han Solo, persisting until he finally wins over his love at the end of the film as he sacrifices himself to save her. The problem is, Han Solo was an absolute legend and a redeemable man. He was a real hero. He was a real guy. And Princess Leia was exactly like him. Hard-headed and strong-willed. They were both equally belligerent personalities. When Han Solo and Princess Leia fall in love, it makes total sense. Because they match each other's energy. However, in the prequel trilogy, Anakin Skywalker is already irredeemable before before Padme shows her love for him. 
and she should already see him as irredeemable, yet falls for him anyway. Even going as far as to act like a complete doormat for him. Halfway through Attack of the Clones, Anakin Skywalker reveals that he's a complete psychopath, killing women and children in a fit of rage. He admits this by screaming in Padme's face that he slaughtered them because he hates those people. And somehow, Padme doesn't even flinch when she hears this. She does not act realistically in this situation at all. Instead, Padme walks up to Anakin and comforts him. That never sat right with me. That scene is so fucking awkward. Then this is repeated in the next film, Revenge of the Sith. Obi-Wan Kenobi tells Padme that Anakin slaughtered children once again. This time, Jedi children. And after Padme finds out that Anakin has murdered children for a second time, Padme still runs to Anakin's side, hoping to win him back by comforting him. Hoping that her love will set him back on the right path. She literally says, all I want is your love. But instead, this time, he breaks her heart. She steps back and says, you're going down a path that I cannot follow. But Padme does not say this to Anakin because she found out that he murdered children. No, 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 no. It's like she doesn't even care about that part. Instead, Padme changes her mind about Anakin because he says he wants to rule the galaxy. Padme's heart is broken because Anakin hates democracy. Now keep all all of this in mind. Let's return back to the special edition edit of The Return of the Jedi, the film where Darth Vader is redeemed by Luke Skywalker. Darth Vader, Anakin Skywalker, is redeemed at the end of the film, and now that redemption is completely ruined. Within the context of the prequel films and the special edition edits, Anakin Skywalker is now redeemed for killing dozens of women and children in fits of rage. The story of Star Wars now says that Anakin Skywalker is redeemable for being a child murderer. And just to make it absolutely sure that we get that this is the point of the prequel trilogy, just to make absolutely sure that we remember what evil things that Anakin Skywalker did, George Lucas went back and changed changed the Blu-ray version of Return of the Jedi to update the story. At the end of Return of the Jedi, when the main cast is celebrating their victory over the Empire, Hayden Christensen shows up as a forced ghost with Yoda and Obi-Wan just to remind us. Hey, you remember this guy? Remember what this guy did? Well, he, well, he's redeemed now. You already agreed to this decades ago. He's redeemed. You all said that he was redeemed already. It's too late to take it back. He's redeemed for killing children. You already said so. That's what the story is now. You all love this film back in the 80s and 90s. You all agreed to this already. Double stampsies, no erases. It's too late. That's not an accident. That's not just sloppy filmmaking by some lunatic director. That's not just bad storytelling. That's not just bad retconning. George Lucas did that on purpose. Star Wars was was ruined on purpose to push an agenda to make child murderers look redeemable. And nobody noticed. You think that's terrible? Well, I've got an even worse example for you. Buckle up. The original Guardians of the Galaxy film is goddamn near perfect. Disney, Marvel, James Gunn set this universe up to be a faithful representation of space adventures and runs the gambit between colorful and whimsical and dark and gritty and manages to meld them perfectly. Notice how I said James Gunn sets this up. 
Well, upon first viewing of the sequel to Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 2, my biggest complaints were that the jokes were too silly and ruined the pacing of the film. And my second complaint was that the ending of the film was not earned. I thought that this was just shitty filmmaking and studio interference and algorithmic writing at first. I thought that this was Disney coming in and telling James Gunn that he's gotta make his movies more goofy to fit with the new tone of Disney. But now I understand why they put such obnoxious jokes in these films. They're trying to make these films so silly that you do not notice that the message of the film is really evil and underhanded. They designed Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 to subvert your moral compass and convey a nefarious message. Human trafficking, child trafficking, is a very serious issue. A very real issue that deserves to be dealt with seriously when depicted in film, especially considering that this is a currently relevant issue. Sylvester Stallone plays a Ravenger in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Near the beginning of the film, Stallone scolds the blue guy. He yells at Yondu for being a child trafficker. Yondu claims that he didn't know what his client was going to do with the children after he trafficked them, implying to the audience that terrible things must have happened to the children after he dropped them off. Stallone replies to Yondu, you didn't know because you didn't want to know. Yondu remained ignorant to the outcome of the children's fate because he wanted money. Yondu wanted to get rich and didn't care that he was a child trafficker. So Sylvester Stallone tells Yondu that child trafficking is the one thing that Ravagers do not do. Child trafficking is the one thing they are not allowed to do. He broke their only rule. Stallone says that Yondu will never receive a Ravenger funeral and will never have the colors of the Ravenger clans wash over his grave. Stallone lays that out to the audience in plain English. It will never happen. It is impossible to be accepted back into the Ravenger order. He will never get a proper funeral. Yondu is a child trafficker. That's it. That's done. Period. And this seems consistent with the character of Yondu that we met in the first Guardians of the Galaxy film. He was a cold-hearted murderous villain, a heartless psychopath who clearly, blatantly abused the main character Peter Quill in his childhood. In fact, at one point, Yondu is a split second away from killing Peter Quill in cold blood and only stops because Peter Quill offers him money. Yondu was going to do it. It was not a bluff. Yondu is a monster. It was clearly established that Yondu was a terrible person who did not give a fuck about Peter Quill. But the sequel, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, focuses heavily on Yondu, humanizing him the entire film. He even becomes best friends with the raccoon, who was the fan favorite character, by the way, from the last film. Yondu even claims that he and the raccoon are exactly the same, something that Rocket Raccoon does not deny. Why would the film try to equate Yondu the child trafficker with the most popular character from the last film? That's just red flag number one. At the end of the film, Yondu helps the main characters defeat the main villain as a manifestation of his guilty conscience, which is fairly realistic to be honest, but some of the things that happen in this scene are a little confusing. For one, Yondu helps Peter Quill by encouraging him to use his heart to win the day, implying that Yondu uses his heart to control his fancy flying arrow weapon. So the film wants you to see Yondu as someone whom uses his heart. Yondu has a heart? That's red flag number two. Later, when he sacrifices his life to save Peter Quill, Yondu implies to Peter that
that he was actually secretly good to him this whole time simply because he didn't traffic him to the villain as a child. We're supposed to see Yondu as humanized because he did not traffic Peter Quill as a child. The one child he didn't traffic. Yondu even goes as far as to call himself Peter Quill's daddy. That's right, Yondu implies that he was a father to Peter Quill. That's red flag number three. Then at the very end of the film, as the main cast is giving Yondu his undeserved funeral, and Peter Quill is crying crying about it and making Yondu look like a giant hero for sacrificing himself, blubbering about what a great father he was which we're gonna call that red flag number four. Somehow the Ravengers all magically show up to the funeral, including Sylvester Stallone and a host of other famous actors, and guess what they do? They wash their Ravenger colors over Yondu's grave. The one thing Sylvester Stallone said he would never do. Sylvester Stallone told Yondu at the beginning of the film this would never Never happen. You are a child trafficker. It is impossible. Stallone laid that out in plain English. But instead, now Stallone says he did not let us down after all. Sylvester Stallone, one of the most famous people on planet Earth, just told the audience of Guardians of the Galaxy 2 that child traffickers are redeemable. Sylvester Stallone alone just redeemed a child trafficker in a Disney blockbuster. And when Disney hired James Gunn to make the Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy, they knew that that's what he was going to do. That was the entire point of Guardians of the Galaxy 2. That was the entire reason Disney hired creepy old James Gunn to direct the films. To trick us into believing that child traffickers are redeemable. That is, without a doubt, the single most evil and disgusting message a Disney film has ever communicated. And they used a hope of famous, recognizable actors, including Ving Rhames and Michelle Yeoh, to push that message on us. They all validate the message. They all salute Yondu. They all imply that he's redeemed. That's why they made Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 goofy and silly. That's why the jokes are obnoxious and destroy every serious moment in the film, so that you wouldn't notice that the message of the film is that child traffickers are redeemable. They were hoping that you would agree that Yondu deserves to be redeemed for being a child trafficker. And nobody noticed. Fuck the entertainment industry. Fuck Disney. Fuck Guardians of the Galaxy. Fuck Star Wars. Fuck George Lucas. Fuck James Gunn. And fuck Hollywood. Hollywood.